Right, awesome. Shabbat shalom! Shabbat shalom! <laughs> All right, well, as you guys can see, um, the title of this message is Feast of Trumpets, Yom Cherua. Okay, and I'm, I'm really excited because uh, I get to share with you all what this day is, what this feast is that's actually coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm Brother Anthony Avalos of SY7 Ministries, and this is our weekly Shabbat message coming to you live from Riverside, California. So welcome if you're joining us for the first time online. Welcome to all of our family here that's joining us uh, in person. Uh, excited to get into this message. Again, I love, 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 love the Feast of the Lord, the Feast of Yehovah. Um, there's seven of them, and this is the fifth feast out of the year of the seven, okay? And AJ, what are the seven feasts of the Lord? Shabbat? Shabbat, Passover, All right, and the Feast of Trumpets is number five, so Yom Tru, the Feast of Trumpets. So today we're going to get into um, the history of this feast, what it, what it means to keep this feast, what, what scripture says about it, and what I, what I really believe um, is very prophetic and significant about this feast and how we need to be paying attention around this feast time throughout the year. So before we get into that, I'll go ahead and open up uh, with the blowing of the shofar right here. The horn, the shofar, this is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Um, this one is... Uh, it's called the Yemenite so far. I think I think I've explained it uh, once or twice to you guys before, um, but it's from the uh, Kudu antelope, mainly in Africa and some parts of Israel, and so they they turn it into an amazing instrument that has a great sound um, for the Lord, and it's used for a lot of different purposes throughout the Bible that we'll get into. So we'll go ahead and go the so far and then pray and get into the message. Amen. I will come before you in the precious name of Yehovah, Yeshua, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for another day that you've allowed us all to be alive and well. Father, we thank you for another day of rest, another Sabbath, another Shabbat, the, the time that you've given us to set aside, set apart from the rest of the week, where we can come together in fellowship, in our holy convocation, and worship unto you and study to get into your scriptures. Thank you for this day. Thank you for what this day means. Thank you for what it represents, Father. A day of rest, final rest with you in time to come. Father, I pray for everybody here right now. I lift everyone up. I pray for all the listeners online, Father, that, that we would all have ears to hear and a heart to receive what it is that you want to teach us in your scriptures about this feast day, about the day of trumpets, the day of the blast, Yom Teruah, this day that is approaching us very soon, Father, and how imperative it is for us to be watching, to be watchmen, to be ready, to be awaiting, to be sounding the alarm to everyone around us, to our families, to our communities, Father. Help us. Help us to be encouraged by this word, to be edified by this word, and may we minister unto you, Father. I pray that everything that comes through my lips would not be my words, but they would be your words, Father. Let no error or untruth reign pass through my mouth, Father. May your word go forth today. To you be the glory, to you be the honor, and to you be all the praise. For you are the King of kings, the only one that deserves the true coronation as the righteous king. And Father, I thank you for this opportunity that I have to share your message, to share your scriptures with those online and with our family here joining us today. So again, Father, just we, we give you all the glory, receive all the honor and all the praise. Father, may I worship and may our, our fellowship be acceptable unto you and prepare our hearts for the day of the blast. So we love you and we praise you and we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, the Feast of Trumpets. In the Hebrew, it's also known as Yom Teruah. Okay, the day is the Hebrew word yom, and then teruah, 
uh, is the Hebrew word uh, for trumpet or horn or ram's horn. And we're going to get into scriptures that show this verse, and we're going to get again get into uh, the meaning of this feast day, uh, the history of this feast day, and uh, what what it represents to us in scripture. Um, throughout the different verses, we'll cover some information about um, the power of the shofar and and the sound waves and the vibrations that that releases when we blow the shofar, when we sound this this heavenly instrument that God has given to us. And most importantly, we'll cover what this day means to the Lord himself and for us as his children, as his people. Amen. Amen. So Leviticus 23, this is where we find the feast. Leviticus 23, verses 23 through 23. Okay? And before I read that, I actually, I want to read something along with that. And it's also in Leviticus 23. So if you're marking this down, you don't need to go any more further. Um, when we go to Leviticus 23, we find that it's all about the feasts of the Lord. And it's, it's, it's interesting because people will say that these are the feasts of the Jews, or these are feasts only for Israel. But right away when we open this chapter, when we start reading in Leviticus 23, verse 1, what do we see the Lord say here? The Lord says, and I'll read Leviticus 23, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feast of the Lord, the feast of Jehovah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. They are his feasts. They're his. He created them. Like, like our Messiah prayed that the Father's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His, his will will come to pass here on the earth as it is in heaven. And these feast days and everything that is in the Bible is a part of that. All of these things have already been established in the heavenly places, in the heavenly realm, the, the, the Sabbath, the feast days, the tabernacle, the temple, all of these things on the earth are a picture of what's happening in heaven. That's why our Messiah prayed those words. And that's why the Lord says here that these are my feast days. They're his before they're anyone else's, before they're Israel's, before they're the Jews, before they're Christians, before they're anybody else's. These are his feast days. And they're all a part of his covenant. His covenant people are those that are in relationship with him. Then it was only Israel. Now, because of Jesus, because of Yeshua, because of Messiah, and his death, burial, and resurrection, now anyone who received Jesus as Messiah is in covenant with God. He, they are in covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is... The new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. This is what he was prophesying. That Jesus would extend the opportunity for the entire earth, whoever was willing to receive him as their Lord and Savior, to be a part of the covenant of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in part with that covenant is knowing the Lord's feast days. Knowing his holy times. What's important to him. Genesis says that he put the stars in the sky. The greater, the, the greater light, the sun, the lesser light, the moon, and the stars in the sky were times and seasons. That word times and seasons in the Hebrew is Moedim. It's not just for summer, or winter, fall, but it's for Moedim, which means appointed times, appointed feast days, festivals. God put those signs in the sky so that we would know when he desires to meet with him. And again, it's extended to the whole earth through Jesus, through Yeshua, through Messiah. And so that's why it's important for us to know about these days, to know about these times, because the Lord says that they're His. And when we belong to Him, when we claim to be His, it is our duty and responsibility to know Him. These are a part of Him. They come from Him. These are not man-made these days. A lot of the holidays that we see people celebrating and different religions, they're man-made. They're tradition. They've been passed down to us through traditions of men and history and different things. And they're man-made. These feasts right here, they're not man-made. They're from God himself. That's why he says they're mine. And I'm giving them to you as a part of my covenant to know when 
to gather together in my name. And Shabbat being one of those, the weekly gathering. That's why we gather on Sabbath. To come together and glorify his name weekly, on a weekly basis, because that's what he desires of us. Now we'll get into the scriptures following. Into, uh, go ahead. Going, what was that, Jeremiah what, 31? Jeremiah, the scripture I referenced about the New Covenant, um, and an actual in Hebrew, that word new is better translated to renew in the Hebrew. Um, because it's a renewed covenant. Jesus didn't bring anything new that was completely new, that was born right. to God. He renewed what was lost. He renewed what was broken by Israel and their disobedience. Yeah. And that's Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. 31, uh, 31 through 34. Yes, sir. And he continues on and he says, if you go up, I believe, all the way to verse 36 and 37, he says, um, I will put my law in there. It won't be like the covenant that was made with Israel. That was written on stone. Mm -hmm. It will be spiritual. It will be through the Holy Spirit who will put his law, his Torah, on their hearts and on their minds. And 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 a lot of people will say that Jesus came and fulfilled all of that, but Jesus, they, that, that verse specifically says that in this time, in these days, no more shall a man teach his neighbor, know the Lord, for all will know him. So clearly, we're not there yet. Clearly. That's not coming until Messiah returns and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We're in this transitional phase where we're in grace and we have the ability. That's why Jesus sent his disciples, go forth and preach the gospel to all nations because I will come back and all will know me, whether they submit it to me or not. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And that will be the finalization of that, of that renewed covenant. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions about any of this stuff, please feel free to ask. So as we get into Leviticus 23, I wanted to open up with that, declaring whose feasts these are. Because the Lord says they're his, right? They're not man-made, they're not created by anybody except for him. And in Leviticus 23, 23 through 25, as they go through the seven feasts of the Lord, as my son recited, Sabbath being the first, and you get all the way down through the spring feast, you see the Israelite people were agricultural. And so they had feasts that coincided with their seasons, the springtime and then the fall as well, okay? And so when you get to the fall, this is the first feast of the fall feasts, and it's called Yom Shru, and it says here, Then Yehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, now this is the seventh biblical month, it's not talking about uh, July, <laughs> it's the seventh biblical month. And when we read the book of Exodus, God gives his people a calendar. It's an agricultural calendar. And the springtime is the head of the year. In Exodus 12, the Lord told the Israelites, you will leave that the land of Egypt when and keep the Passover, I'm paraphrasing, and keep the Passover when the barley is a bee, in the month of the of a bee, when the barley is a bee. And so that, that signifies a time of the year. And, and the Lord also said that this will be the head of your months. And so he established right then and there that the month of Aviv, the first month, and that's a whole other teaching and topic here we can get into at another time. But this is the beginning of the biblical year. It's the head of the year. It's the biblical new year in the springtime, which makes sense, right? Because what happens in the spring? Things come to life, mm -hmm. right? Things sprout. Things, things grow. New life begins in the spring. And so that's the head of the year, and, and Yom Shuruah, this, this feast specifically, is in the seventh month, on the first day of the month. Now this word month here in the Hebrew is uh, Kadesh, and it means moon. It can also mean moon, not just month, but, new, but moon, okay? And when you look at the biblical calendar, some of you may know this already, but historically a lot of uh, ancient societies would keep track of their months by the lunar cycle. By the, the by, the days of the of the moon, by the length the, the the longevity of the moon cycle, which is about 29 and a half to 30 days every single month, and so they were to keep watch and they were to wait for the the first day of the seventh month. And I'm going to get into a little bit later exactly how we do that um, and why that's important. On the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest. So this is a Sabbath. It's considered a uh, a high holy day. This is a day where we set aside all of our labors, we set aside all of our, our work, we set aside all of our personal ambitions, and we rest in the Lord. 
God, God requires the attention of his people. God demands that his people put down their own will and look to him. And this is one of those times when we do that. This is one of those times where the Lord says that it is, it is a Sabbath rest, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a blowing of trumpets. So this is a day, this is the time on the first day of the seventh month when they would rest and they would blow the trumpets. You hear that all day long on this day, okay? A holy convocation. So what is a holy convocation? This right here. No matter how big, no matter how small, this is a holy convocation, a gathering where God's people come together and they honor him, and they worship him. You can do that in the comfort of your own home, just like we're doing, hallelujah. Or you could do that with an assembly, a sacred assembly of hundreds of people. Whatever, whatever your situation is, the Lord says that on this day, you have a holy convocation. You put aside the rest of your life, you put aside the rest of your, your worries, your wants, your desires, and you come together, you blow the shofar, you gather with my people, and you praise my name, and you recognize who I am and what I've done for you, and you declare who I am to the earth. That's what happens when we blow that sound, when we blow that shofar. We're making a declaration. We're sounding the alarm. We're warning the world, and we're going to show what, why that is. So it says, you shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yehovah. So they would come together, and they would, they would do, um, back then when the sacrificial system was still in place, they would do the offerings required, the specific offerings that are required for this day. And it was a, an act of worship and praise and offering to the Lord to slaughter these animals. It might seem like a foreign idea to us, but it was a, an act of worship. An offering unto the Lord to do these things. This is all things that points to our Messiah. He was the ultimate offering, the ultimate sacrifice. And what does the Bible say that is our sacrifice and offering now? Our worship, our praise, our devotion to Him. So we're not going to get together and killing animals, no, because our Messiah took that final sacrifice and offering for us with His life. Make no mistake about it, though. When He comes back, and when the temple is reinstituted on the earth, the book of Ezekiel does tell us that there will be sacrifice and offering again. Again, that's a little another teaching that we can get into and talk about. But for now, Messiah is up there in heaven interceding for us daily because of our of our high priest that he is. He made that final sacrifice for us unto death. Okay? And so our worship and our praise and our devotion to him is our sacrifice and offering now. It, it temporarily took the place of the shedding of blood for animals. Does that make sense? Did you have a question, brother? No, I was just going to say, <coughs> if it was up to us, we'd work day and night, seven days a week. Exactly. You know what I mean? I, okay, can you help me off this battery here? Um, I'm not sure why it's running. Oh, I don't know if it's plugged in. Angela? The, uh, the laptop battery? Uh, the charger came undone. Alright, so we just read Leviticus 23, 23 through 25, and in this verse, we have two terms that I want to break down, okay? The word trumpets in the Hebrew is terua. That's why you guys saw with the, the, the slide that I had in the beginning, Yom Teruah, Day of the Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets, Day of the Trumpet. That's literally what that means, Kerua, okay? And it means acclamation of joy, a battle cry, especially clangor of trumpets as an alarm, alarm to blow these trumpets of, of joy, excuse me, jubilee, during the jubilee year, 50th year of the agricultural cycle, on the Day of Trumpets, they would blast and sound the trumpets all day long, and it was a huge feast and celebration. A loud noise, rejoicing, shouting, all of these symbolized that so far right there. An alarm, a warning, a battle cry, a joyful shout of praise. The root word 
to this word literally means to split the ears. To split the ears. Pretty interesting, right? Mm -hmm. With the sound, with shout, or an alarm. To blow an alarm, to cry aloud, to destroy. Man, when I hear that, what does that make you think of, these trumpets? To split the ears, to destroy. It makes you think of what it does to our enemies, to God's enemies. Remember the, 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 the we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little later before I get ahead of myself. As you can see, I love talking about the Lord's feast days. This is an exciting topic because we're his people and he gave these to us to remember him by. As we read, it's a, it's a memorial. These are the things that should be reminding us of who we serve. And it, it, it's in these that we get hope, we get strength, we get rejuvenation. No matter what's happening around us, we, we partake in these things and they remind us of who we are in him. And what it is that our Messiah did for us. Another word that we find that translates from trumpets, it is a few different Hebrew words, and that's the thing about the English, right? That's why we like to take the scriptures back to the Hebrew, because the English sometimes, as it's transliterated, it'll use one generic word for a bunch of different Hebrew words, and a bunch of different verses. So the only the only word, really, that you'll see about trumpets or, 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 or these kinds of instruments in the English is Trumpets or ram's horn sometimes, or, and depending on what version of Bible you have, they'll, they'll even say shofar sometimes. But there's literally like four or five different kinds of trumpets in the Hebrew that we can read about and learn about when we look at the ancient Hebrew. So shofar is another term, right? You guys have heard that word, shofar. That's also used in the Bible to describe a trumpet or a ram's horn. And it means a cornet as giving a clear sound, a curved horn, a curved trumpet, um, similar to like this one, or the ram's horn that I, I showed you guys earlier, it's like the actual, actual ram's horn. This, this is, is, yeah, it's a little small example of a yobel, a ram's horn, that's another Hebrew term that's used in the scriptures to describe the ram's horns, the trumpets. That's the next word I'll get into, yobel. Again, it's a, it's a, a word to describe these instruments, and it means a blast of a horn, specifically the signal of the silver trumpets. And I don't have a silver trumpet, but those are really cool. We used to have one in our congregation in Colorado. They're really long silver trumpets, and the elders would blow those, the priests would blow those for specific purposes, okay? And, um, okay, so these are the trumpets that we're talking about here, all these different kinds, the Yovel, the Shofar, um, Cherua. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. It says, And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for the calling of the congregation and for the directing of the movement of the camps. When they blow both of them, all the congregations shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel shall gather to you. When you sound the advance, the camps that lie on the east side shall then begin their journey. When you sound the advance the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall begin their journey. They shall sound the call for them to begin their journeys. And when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow but not sound the advance. So there were specific uh, um, blows that they had, specific callings for specific purposes, but not sound the advance. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets, and all and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land and against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before Yehovah, your Elohim, before the Lord your God. And you will be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifice of your peace offerings. And they shall be a memorial before you, before 
your God. I am the Lord your God. So we see all these different purposes in this one passage of the trumpets. To be sounded to call the people. Hey, we're gathering. Hey, we're moving. We're getting ready to advance. Listen up for the trumpet call. On the battlefield, we're getting ready to advance and attack. That's that's not a, a, a recent invention. We know since since ancient times, trumpets have been used on the battlefield. Sound the advance. Charge, right? That, that old trumpet sound on the battlefield back in the, uh, World War I and World War II to go into battle, that's not a new thing. People have been doing that since ancient times, and it's, it's a biblical concept. The Israelites did the same thing, and God gave these instruments to the Israelites so that they could use them. And we also read about them being used for their feast day, right? For celebration, for worship, to blow them over their offering. That's why when we're worshiping and we're singing, You'll see us blow the shofars, because that's what their purpose is. A joyful shout, a joyful noise. So we see all these different purposes in the congregation. Now this word specifically, uh, trumpets, in, in this verse, Numbers 10, 1 through 10, as I mentioned, it's the silver trumpet, so it's a little different. It's the Hebrew word, Hatzorah. Hatzorah. Okay? And it's, uh, it's a trumpet. It's a silver trumpet. I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen them, but the long, the long silver trumpets, sometimes they're gold. Really, really long trumpets. Um, and again, they're they're very loud, and if you know how to play them, um, they sound they sound beautiful, but they can get really, really loud because again, their purpose was to get people's attention. Um, so this is the this is the word that's used in numbers. And so the silver trumpets were for gathering of the people, guiding the people, going into battle, blowing in the feast days. If we go to Numbers, next verse here, Numbers 31, verses 1 through 7, we see the example of them waging war on the enemies of God. Numbers 31, 1 through 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. After we shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, And some of yourselves for war, arm some of yourselves for war. And let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for the Lord on Midian. A thousand from each tribe of all the tribes of Israel, he shall stand to the Lord. So there were recruited from the divisions of Israel, one thousand from each tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. One thousand from each tribe. Twelve thousand armed for war. When Moses sent them to the war, 1,000 from each tribe, he sent them to the war with, with Phineas, the son of Eliezer. So Phineas was a righteous high priest in God's eyes, with the holy articles and the silk and the, the signal trumpets in his hand. So they're going to battle with these trumpets in their hands. And they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. So this was an instrument used for warfare, a call to battle that Yehovah himself would respond to. As we read earlier in Numbers, the Lord told them, Sound this in your battle, and I will deliver you. I will move on your behalf when you sound these trumpets. How powerful and amazing is that? And we still have these today. Go ahead. So it changes the atmosphere. Yes, literally. Yes, exactly. This sound, this frequency, this noise, this blast, changes the atmosphere all around us. It confuses the enemy. It makes it drive and it's a split to their ears is what we read. Mm -hmm. Joshua chapter six. This shofar, this sound, it still has this power today. And it's unfortunate because many people they don't use them. Many Christians, many believers, they're I've 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 begun to see more and more shofars and congregations and churches, and that's awesome. But there's still so many people that don't know what a shofar is, don't know its purpose, don't know its power, and how God's told his people to use them as weapons of warfare and as, as, as weapons of praise to give him glory and honor. Joshua 6, 1 through 7. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And as the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. Remember, when we read about Jericho, first the Israelites were afraid. 
they were afraid because these Canaanite men were, were large. They were, they were big. They were mighty. As some of the, the unfaithful spies says, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. These were, these were huge, huge men, giants even. Right. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout. That's why if you can't blow well, so far, it's okay. Shout unto the Lord. Then, go, amen, little baby girl. <laughs> then, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let them who is on advance before the Ark of the Lord. And we know the story. We know. Amen. We know that as soon as the trumpet blasted on the seventh day, for the seventh time, and the men shouted, what happened to the walls of Jericho? They came tumbling down. They came tumbling down. It changes the atmosphere, this noise, this sound. It was the blast of the shofar that Yah used to bring down the mighty walls of Jericho. If we have walls in our life, if we have bondage in our life, if we have, if we have boundaries in our life, and we feel like we're just not breaking through, going deeper with the Lord, and if we hit a wall in our faith, we hit a wall in our, in our relationship with Him, make a shout, make a joyful noise, blow that shofar and declare who the Lord is in your life. That's right. Break those walls down. Get into that place, into that city that the Lord is giving you to conquer. Whatever it is in your life, this is what the day of the blast is representing. This is what Yom Shrua is all about. Can you imagine the blowing of the shofars and the bricks and the rocks just tumbling to the ground, falling down these huge walls? Ancient Eastern walls were not small. They didn't use tiny little bricks like we use today. They used huge bricks, bricks the size of half of a man even, giant walls, and they came tumbling down. Next one, Judges 7, 15 through 22, story of Gideon. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll read a few verses here, but the story of Gideon, you can find it in Judges chapter 6 and 7, verses 15 through 22. <coughs> And it says, so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him, so he had a hundred men with him, but he was actually prescribed 300 men. And they were, they were separated into um, planks or battalions or, or um, units, a hundred each. So Gideon had a hundred with him. And they came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and blow, broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, the sword of Yehovah and of Gideon, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, Yehovah sent every man sword against his companions. Throughout the whole camp, and the army fled to Beth Ahaika toward Zerubbabel, as far as the border of Abel Maholath by Tabak. So they blew those trumpets sound, and their enemies started killing each other. It was a sharp cut to their ears, and it caused confusion amongst them, and they began killing one another. They didn't even have to go down and defeat them. All they had to do was break the pictures and blow the shofar. They started killing themselves. And then they just went in and finished the job. That's the power behind God's shofar. That's the power behind God's trumpet, behind this instrument. And briefly, what you had mentioned about how the atmosphere changes, it's called somatic frequency. Somatic frequency is a scientific term. And it talks about vibrational energy that tells us that everything in the universe vibrates. And puts out a frequency. Everything. Rocks put out a frequency. Dirt 
puts out a frequency. Your bodies operate at an optimal level of frequency. Even your clothes, because they're fabric, and they're taken from real wool and fabric and linen, they put out a frequency. Blood puts out a frequency. We were just reading this the other day with a family of how when the Lord said that say, uh, Cain, that your brother's blood cries out to me. It has a frequency. Semantic frequency reveals that sound waves can manipulate these, vibra these vibrations and frequencies changes the atmosphere, as you said. Studies have shown that sound waves can create images and patterns that are visible to the naked eye. They've done tests, and I've seen some of them myself, where they'll have sand in like this panel thing, and they'll play different kinds of music or frequencies or, or vibrations, and the sand will begin moving in different shapes. That's the power of sound. That's the power of frequency. Even the closer we were. Yes, amen, I said that, yes. It has been shown that application of ultrasound waves can stimulate healing in your body. That's the power of sound. God created sound. That's why he said when he created the heavens and the earth, what did he do? He spoke. <coughs> he spoke. You were literally created through the sound of the Lord's mouth. Low amp. Low amplitude, high frequency sound, and bone fracture, healing, um, sound frequency, vibration, they all play a role in changing the atmosphere or shifting matter, as you said. We can't even imagine what takes place in the spiritual realm when we blow this so far. I mean, think about that for a second. Things that the naked eye can't see. What's happening in the spiritual realm with these, when these powerful sounds, these powerful frequencies are going out to the atmosphere? calling upon the Lord, causing confusion amongst our enemies. When we blow these shofars, when we sound these alarms, demons flee. I believe that. They flee. They hate that sound. They can't stand that sound. It causes them confusion. It's a split to their ears. A signal of warning. Signal of warning. How many have read Ezekiel 33? Sword of the watchman on the wall. Oh, yeah. Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 11. Also in Ezekiel uh, 18, I believe. Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 11. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he what? Blows the trumpet. If he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. So if the watchman on the wall blew the alarm and those who heard didn't act, didn't heed the warning, their blood is on their own head. They didn't listen to the warning. They didn't listen to the alarm. But he who takes warning He heard, the, excuse me, he heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but... His blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. <clears throat> Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore, you, O son of man, save the house of Israel. Thus you say, if our transgression and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, if follow me. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? 
O house of Israel. This is the same today. God is the same. He does not change. Malachi 3.6. Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, the same yesterday, today, and forever. This message still needs to resound in our hearts and in our minds right now more than ever. Are we being faithful watchmen? Are we sounding the alarm? Are we warning the wicked around us? Or are we just letting it be? Compromising, staying quiet, acting like it's okay, like it's no big deal, and accepting the wicked ways of those around us. Because we should be faithful watchmen. Just like God charged Ezekiel here to warn his people, Israel, then of the coming destruction, it's no different now. If you know the word of God, if you know what's to come, and the judgment and the wrath of God is your duty. It's our duty to warn people and tell people, do you know the Lord? Do you know who your Messiah is? Do you know Jesus? Do you know salvation? Do you know him? Because you need to. All this, all this wickedness in your life, all this evil in your life, this sin, that, that's what's causing you pain. That's what's causing you heartache. That's what's tearing you down. But... Jesus will set you free. Okay. We need to be preaching this message now more than ever. Yeah. We're running out of time, brothers right. and sisters. We are running out of time, and Yom Teruah is a testament to that. Yom Teruah is a witness against us that we are running out of time. This feast day is a prophetic feast day. 2 Chronicles 13, 12. 2 Chronicles 13, 12. Now look, God himself, Elohim himself, is with us as our head, and his priests with sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. So with these passages we find, and this was a, cha this was a chapter describing when um, Israel was split into two kingdoms, I believe, and they were fighting amongst themselves. North and south were fighting amongst themselves. Other. The kingdoms were split, they were divided because of a lot of evil in the land. And they're declaring, the Lord is with us. Do not fight against us. Do not die. Some people just run to their own death, don't they? They run to things they know are not good for them. We've all done that. We've all run to our own punishment. Like that term goes, there must be blood for punishment. We're all blood for punishment, right? We've all done these things. So with these different passages, we find that the shofar, the sound of God's trumpet, is a call to repentance. It's a call to repentance, a warning to the wicked, a warning to believers who are going astray. Wake up. Hear the alarm. Wake up. Hear the blast. Hear the warning, because the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The coronation of a righteous king, I, I, I love this example here. The coronation of a righteous king. If we go to 2 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, some backstory about this. This, this, this book of kings, First and Second Kings, I love this book. It's a historical book, and it's a book of records of kings who reigned in Israel and in Judah, and their stories, whether they were righteous kings or wicked kings. Mm -hmm. Deaths and successions. This passage here is specifically about Joash being rightfully crowned as king. There was a lot of corruption in the times of kings. People assassinating for power. People hungry for power. We read, we read about Jezebel in the books of Kings. How she tried to manipulate and be, be very, very deceitful and take power of the throne. The throne was basically up for grabs in the times of the kings. Many false kings tried to rise up. And this is no different, okay? We read about Joash being rightfully crowned as king, but it wasn't easy because at that time, his grandmother, her name is Athaliah, and she was actually the daughter of Jezebel, okay? Athaliah killed all of Joash's brothers and wanted to kill him so that she could rule, just like Jezebel. She wanted to kill all the prophets of God. She controlled her husband, Ahaz, to be the king that she wanted him to be. 2 Kings 11, 1 through 3. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. 
Doesn't this sound familiar? Who else did this? Pharaoh? King Herod, when Jesus was born? This is how the enemy operates. He tries to come in and stop what the Lord is doing. But he can't. No matter how much he tries. Mm-hmm. Oh, that old anti-Messiah spirit, that old anti-Christ spirit, let's come in and change the path of God, change the, the will of God on the earth. He'll, he'll try, but he can't. He can't. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. Much like Moses in Exodus, right? They had to hide him. Yeah. And they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah, so that he was not killed. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years. Well, Athaliah reigned over the land, so they had him in hiding. And if we continue on, if we move down to verses 10 through 14, as you can see reading, it shows the story on both how despite these heinous acts to steal the throne and take the rightful place from who it belonged to, the Lord intervened, and he put who he wanted king in power. Verse 10, it says, And the priests gave the captains of hundreds the spears and shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. Then the escort stood, every man with his weapon in his hand, all around the king, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, by the altar and the house. And he brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony. They made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the escort and the people, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. When she looked there, she was... She, when she looked, there was the king standing by a pillar according to the custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. They were singing, they were praising, they were blowing the trumpets. All the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Why? Because they were coordinating this king. He was the rightful king. And the trumpets, they were his coronating sound. So Athaliah tore her clothes as a sign of great shame and anguish and and uh, being very, very shamed and upset, and cried out, treason, treason, because she knew she lost. Right. She lost in that moment. This was a plot straight from Satan to kill the rightful king of the land, straight from the Antichrist. Antichrist. You see, we hear the term Antichrist, and right away we think that it's something that's coming in the future, but the spirit of Antichrist has been alive and well all throughout the earth since the fall of the garden. It's anything that is anti God, anti the will of God, anti the plans of God, tries to sabotage what the Lord is putting into place. There have been many anti-Christ figures in history. Antiochus Epiphanes was one of them. You read about his story, what he did, Hitler. All these figures, a lot of different figures. There's always been a plan and a plot for evil to take all of the power, and I think we're seeing that right now, right? Evil and its plots and its plans through different governments, political parties are trying to take power of the earth. The elites trying to take power of the earth and control the people. Yeah, just like we see here, God's plans will always triumph. Always. The rightful king will be crowned. And who is our rightful king? Jesus. Sure, yes. And when he comes, we will hear the sound of his coronation. We will hear that trumpet blast. We will hear that Cheruah, Yom Cheruah, the day of the blast, his coronation, his announcement to the world that he is here and he is the righteous king. No matter what any government has tried to do, no matter what any elitist or power hungry criminal has tried to do, he is the righteous king. And no one will stop that from happening. No one. God will descend and appear at the sound of of the last trumpet. The sound of the last trumpet. Exodus 19, verses 16 through 20. Exodus 19, verses 16 through 20. This is when the Lord met the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. 
and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the front of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because Jehovah descended upon it in fire. Listen to that. The trumpet was blasting loud, and the Lord descended upon the mountain. Wow. The Lord descended upon the mountain when the trumpet was blasting. That is a picture of our Messiah. The Word says, and I believe it's in Zechariah 14 and in other places, that the Messiah will come and touch down on the Mount of Olives, and they will be split in two. His foot will descend upon the mountain again at the sound of the trumpet. Now Mount Sinai was completely covered in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. His smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. This picture here of this trumpet sounding, blasting, the shofar sounding, and the Lord descending upon the mountain of the earth. Revelation 8, verses 2 through 6. Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 through 6. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven, what? Trumpet. Trumpets. Mm-hmm. Seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer with the prayers of all the saints. So that's another picture of our prayers, are, are the incense, the sacrifice, the incense offering. Those are our prayers now. The heavenly offerings, the heavenly censers and incense, on earth as it is in heaven. You look at the tabernacle pattern and even the temple and the incense altar, and how they were commanded to make specific ingredients of incense, and the censers, the bowls, would, would make smoke, and they would go to the Holy of Holies and touch the Ark of the Covenant. Well, we're reading about that in Revelation. It's happening in heaven. The angels are doing the same thing with the prayers of the saints. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It's a picture. The earthly pattern replicates the heavenly pattern. That's why Jesus prayed that. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything that we've seen take place for God on the earth. The temple, the tabernacle, even the priesthood and the feast days are all a replica of what's happening in heaven. Amen? Amen. Alright, so he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of incense with the prayers of the rites of the saints excuse me, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Seven angels, seven trumpets. So they can find the tribulation times. What God is going to unleash on the earth during the tribulation time. And we read... Revelation 8, 2 through 6. Now we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. And we read in Exodus that the Lord descended on the mountain at the sound of the trumpet. And here we see that's going to happen again. So we read in Revelation that there's seven trumpets. And if you read about those trumpets in the book of Revelation, each of them release a specific um, plague on the earth or a judgment or punishment on the earth. If you read the book of Revelation. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-54 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Out of the seven trumpets of the angels, he says the last trumpet. How many of us have ever been taught this doctrine, this idea that Christians are going to start pooping and vanishing before the tribulation happens? I've been taught that. Yeah. I've learned that. I used to believe that. But if we look at the scriptures and what the scriptures teach us, there's a specific time when the seven trumpet blasts and Paul declares that that is when 
and Messiah comes. And that is when believers are changed in that moment of the twinkling of an eye. That the dead in Christ are rise up at the seventh trumpet. Not at the first, not at the third, not at the fourth, not even before any of the sound. At the seventh trumpet, when the Lord comes back. This is when these things happen. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it is written, Death is swallowed up here. It's all said and done. After the tribulation happens and it's plagued the earth, and God has unleashed his wrath on the earth and has judged the wicked for all these different events that happen sequentially, the seven trumpet blasts. Our Lord appears in the sky. The dead in Christ rise first, is what Paul is saying. And we, those who are alive and remain, if we're, if we're alive at his coming, will be caught up with him and changed. The twinkling of an eye. This corrupting, decaying, dying body will literally be changed to an incorruptible form. That's what this is saying here. And it happens at the last trumpet. The last trumpet. So, why do so many believe that Christians are just going to be poofing and vanishing left and right before the tribulation even happens? Why, why is that a thing? Why is that so such a popular doctrine? It's called pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. That's the idea. This, this idea that, pre, that, the, that the rapture, the, the catching up, is what that, that word simply means, is going to take place before the tribulation even starts. And it's a doctrine. And pre-tribulation doctrine, theology, was popularized extensively in the 1830s. This isn't even an old doctrine. This is relatively new. It didn't come about until originally in the 1830s, and it wasn't really popularized until the last 60, 70 years by a lot of mainstream Christian teachers and pastors. But it, it really came from the 1830s by a man named John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby. And he was a member of the Plymouth Brother, kind of like a, a cultic uh, denomination. They, had, they, were, this, they were the first dispensationalists. They believed that God would stop his, his prophetic timeline uh, just so that people could essentially catch up to where they need to be and get right in their life. God doesn't stop this prophetic timeline for anybody. God continues moving, and, and, and it's our job to get on board with what he's doing when we see the sign. He'll call on the hearts of men. The, the Holy Spirit will lead and call on the hearts of people to repent. And God is merciful. God is merciful. He says in, in, in Matthew uh, 24, I believe that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth before the end comes. That will happen. He can wait forever. And so that's that's kind of the gist of dispensationalism. And and it further was popularized in the, in the United States in the early 20th century by again a wide circulation of there's a there's a Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. Who's heard of that? The Schofield Reference Bible. So the Schofield Reference Bible actually. Um, a lot of a lot of his footnotes, a lot of his interpretations of these scriptures were derived from the doctrine of John Nelson Darby. And Schofield Reference Bible became a very popular Bible in a lot of seminaries and a lot of Bible schools. A lot of pastors, a lot of teachers would, would use the Schofield Reference Bible. And so, how does that um, look as time goes on? People begin to believe and accept the preacher doctrine and start teaching it from the pulpit. Before this preacher and rapture wasn't even an idea in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church didn't even believe this. Mm. Again, it's a relatively new idea. The Scopio Bible is how the doctrine gains a lot of popularity in these seminary schools. And then, finally, we see, and we we're just talking about this this morning, the Left Behind series of Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. And how popularized that became with those guys. Their, their, their books, these books, they sold over 65 million copies of this book. So people were eating it up. People were buying it. People were eating it up. People were promoting this, this idea like wildfire. And my mom was even telling me that 
uh, Calvary, Calvary Chapel, one of the most popular and influential churches in America, was playing it from their services. And I'd imagine a lot of churches were doing that. They were playing these movies at their services. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people were, were seeing this and saying, wow, that's going to happen. Yeah. That's going to happen. People are just going to vanish and poof and disappear. Man, airplanes yeah. are going to be crashing and cars are going to yeah. be crashing. Yeah. Because people are just going to be disappearing. <laughs> But the rapture, that, right? Yeah, the, ra- the the rapture, specifically pre-tribulation rapture, before all the bad things start happening, before judgment is unleashed on the earth. That's what this doctrine teaches: is that Christians, if they're faithful, are just going to poof this spirit. They're not going to have to endure any of the hard thing. But is that what Scripture teaches? Is that what the Bible tells us? First no. Thessalonians four, sixteen through eighteen. First Thessalonians four, sixteen through eighteen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Just like we read in Exodus. At the shout and the sound of the trumpet, the Lord will descend. And according to Revelation, there's seven trumpets. And according to Corinthians, it's on the seventh trumpet. The last trumpet. The final trumpet. This is when the Lord will descend. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So the dead who are Messiah, those who died in Messiah, they will be resurrected first. Then we who are alive and remain, those who are living, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. See that the the preacher of rapture, um, promoters will take this verse and will say, you see, because of the verse here, the word here, caught up. They'll yeah. say, you see, that, that's what's going to happen. We're going to be caught up. Yeah. We're going to come and, and we're going to go up and, and that's that's the rapture. It's going to get it twisted. Huh? Yes, if we, if, we don't, if, we don't, if we don't look at these scriptures and passages and let scripture interpret scripture and look at the Bible as a whole and in context it's talking about how the dead will be raised first. Right. And then those who are alive and remain will be caught up. And we read in Corinthians that it doesn't happen until the sound of the last trumpet. And we read in Revelation that there are actually seven trumpets, all of them signaling different judgments throughout the tribulation. So it's after the tribulation happens that our Messiah returns, and those who are alive and survive will be caught up with him. Will be caught up with him. It's a process, right? It's a process. And if you, you know what? We don't like the idea of suffering. I believe that's why the, 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 yeah. the popularization of this, of this doctrine really took wind with a lot of people. Because we don't like the idea of suffering or being hurt or being uncomfortable or having to go through hard times and hardships. No, we like the idea of being spared from all these things. Mm-hmm. Not having to see all these things. It's just easier to think like that. Right? But the Bible warns us that those who endure to the end will be saved. And in the book of Revelation, the first three chapters warn the seven churches that those who are faithful through all of the hardships will be saved and their robes will be washed in the blood of the Lamb. They will be given a crown with the name of, of the city of God and the name of God. They'll be given a white stone, a friendship stone with a the, with the new name. All these things are gifts to those who survive and who don't bow down the knee to Baal, the beast, who don't accept the mark, who don't compromise, who don't conform to the evil, those are the ones who endure to the end, who are willing to, to sacrifice everything, even unto death, to be faithful to God. Just like the did and the disciples. Those are the examples that we see. John 17, 13 through 19, just some more verses here that I really believe show us <laughs> there's no sneaking out the back door when stuff goes bad. It's not going to happen. In fact, this is Messiah's prayer. This is Jesus' prayer for his disciples specifically when he gave them the commission to go out into the world. John chapter 17, a powerful, powerful passage that Messiah prayed for his people. And it says in verses 13 through 19, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, 
And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. What? Whoa. Hold it now. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. No sneaking out the back door. But that you should keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one. Protect them. Deliver them. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We are sanctified by his word. His word is truth. We need to know this word, brothers and sisters, so that it will sanctify us. Because when we know this word, when we live for this word, it changes us from the inside in. It changes our lives. It changes our behaviors. It changes how we want to live and how we think. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. So he says, keep them from the evil one. Let's look at another example of, of history in Exodus. Now, Scripture says, and I have this verse here, it's in, uh, just to kind of jump forward a little bit, Isaiah 46.10. Isaiah 46 10 says this, it says, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. What does that mean, declaring the end from the beginning? Declaring the end from the beginning, what does that mean? Anybody? Declaring the end from the beginning. It's a done deal already. It's a done deal? <laughs> it's already been done. Yeah. It's already been said. It's already, it's already been, been said, said, exactly. It's already been said. Where at? In the Word. You will know the end by the beginning, is what God is telling us. You want to know what's going to happen in the last days? Look at the beginning of the book. Look at the history of how I've done things in the past. Look at how I've delivered my people in the past. Look at the plagues that I put on the earth in the past. Look at what I've required of my people in the past. In the beginning of the book, in the Torah, in the instructions, in the history of his people, he declares the end from the beginning. It's already been done. Christ, the word says that Christ was crucified before the foundations of the earth. It's already been done. We just need to know the word. All right, so knowing, reading that, we go back to Exodus 8. Exodus 8. Jesus says we know the end from the beginning. Isaiah said that. He declared that, speaking on behalf of the Lord. Exodus 8, verses 21 through 23. For if you do not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you, and on your servants, and on your people, and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they dwell. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen. I will set apart the land of Goshen. For my people are living, so that no swarms of flies will be there, in order that you may know that I, Yehovah, I am in the midst of the land, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign will occur. He will separate his people from the rest. Goshen, I don't have a map, but it was literally an area in the land of Egypt where the Israelites dwelt. It's amazing. They actually found um, um, the words, I don't know, brain spasm right now. Archeo archaeological evidence yeah. in the land of Egypt, in the area of Goshen, of Canaan people, Israelite people that dwelt there. And God is saying here, I'm going to put a plague on all the land of Egypt except my people's land. Right? He will divide. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. He will separate the sheep from the goats. That is exactly what the Lord does. Wasn't it during when all the plagues were happening, 
of all the plagues were going on, the Egyptian, or excuse me, the, the Israelites were kept safe from all of that. They had a separate, yeah. wasn't that correct? They had that's, a separate. Yeah, that's exactly what, what, that's exactly what we're looking at. It doesn't mention it for every single plague, right. but, the, but the majority of the plagues it specifically mentions where um, God separates his people from the Egyptians. And the only people that, that suffer through the plagues are the Egyptians. I think it's only a couple of plagues where it doesn't mention that, like the blood in the water, right. um, and I think the frogs. It doesn't specifically mention that they won't affect my people, but the rest of them, um, the majority of them say that all the flies infected the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. All the cattle and the animals died, but not, the, not the cattle and the animals of the, of the Israelites. But let's go to the next one, uh, Exodus 9, 3 through 6. Exodus 9, verses 3 through 6. It says, Behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. The Lord said a, a definite time, saying, Tomorrow, the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. Man. When I see this, that gives me hope and courage. And no matter what kind of plagues and wrath is unleashed on the earth in the tribulation, God is the same. God is faithful. And if we obey Him and if we're faithful to Him, no, we don't need to sneak out the back door because he's going to keep us safe right where we're at. Right. In the midst of the storm. Right. In the midst of the death. In the midst of the plague. In the midst of the fires. Just like the three Hebrew boys. He will be right there with us. This is what the Lord declares. Not poof and you're gone. You don't have to worry about anything. No. It's you don't have to worry about anything because regardless of what's happening around you, I will be with you. And that's what he teaches us. Exodus 9, 25 through 26. That's that one. I think I don't have some of the PowerPoint. I think I forgot that one. But Exodus 9, 25 to 26. I missed that one in the PowerPoint. Sorry. Um, it says, The hail struck all that was in the field through, the land, through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail also struck every plant in the field and shattered every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. There was no hail. God can do that. Rain and hail and fire falling all around except for one area. That blows our minds if we think about that. That doesn't happen. God can do that. Next one, chapter 10, verses 13, or 21 through okay, sure, 13 through 14. Can I share something with you? Um, sure, go ahead. It, it, it reminds you of that. Um, we were um, praying for people on a baseline in the street. And it was a, it was a cloudy day. You know, and, and, and we were praying for a lot of people at this point. And then all of a sudden, the, the clouds opened up in a circle. Right around us, right around us, just right there where we're at, wow. it opened up. Yeah. And and I put it out to everybody, and they were just like, "Whoa, man!" I mean, I mean, it was cloudy everywhere. Yeah. Real dark clouds. Yeah. Except for us, right there. The Lord can do that. Yeah. He's he done that. Yeah. He holds the wind in his fist. He yeah. controls the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. You know, he told us not to go out during this. This virus thing to go out in the street to minister to the people. Yeah. But like in Ezekiel, you know, we're the watchmen. Yeah. And we went out there believing that God is going to protect us, yeah. and He did. None of us got sick. We weren't afraid to touch the the, the, the homeless. They're real dirty. I mean, they don't have a bath. They don't yeah. got a bath, and you know all that. Yeah. But God protected us. Praise the Lord. I, I, I trust in it. He'll continue to do that for yeah. those who obey him, for those who listen to him, for those who yeah. are led by his voice. 
to protect the Sabbath, but we have to know his voice, and we have to be listening to his voice. You want to know what kind of left behind I'm afraid of? Uh-huh. It's not the left behind of seeing people disappear. <laughs> it's the left behind of not hearing his voice. Yes. That's what I'm afraid of. Father, please keep me close to you. Keep me in the spirit and not in the flesh so that I will hear your Holy Spirit when you tell me move or when you tell me to stay or when you tell me to speak or when you tell me to be quiet. That's the kind of left behind that I'm afraid of. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be stuck in, in, in left behind when, when the spirit is moving and he's there saying, go, go, or stay, stay. And because we're so caught up in the world or we're so caught up with fear and mass hysteria like the rest of the world or we're caught up with our own flesh that we just miss it. Yeah. We're not hearing his voice. And he will keep moving and he will choose someone else to carry out his will if we don't answer the call. That's the kind of left behind I'm scared of. Yeah. We your should your life shows that. You and, and answer life show that. You've been hearing God's voice and you've been moved by him. You know, everywhere you've gone, right? Every move you make, that, that's that happen. It's all in his glory. I mean, did you go to Israel and, yes. and she went to New York and yes. went to Afghanistan and yes. all that stuff, Georgia, I mean, yeah. Denver, I mean, all of that's been you've been moved by God. You Amen. Know? I've been watching this man. I'm here, you know, and watching you guys, the like, Lord just moving you, man. It's just so amazing, brother. So crazy, crazy. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to be left behind on that either, <laughs> man. I mean, I'm serious. All right, so if we say it's time to go, then you better snap your back and go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't be afraid of move. All right, amen. That's all right, brother. Amen. Hey, all, all glory to him. Hey, and, and I thank you for that. It's all his for his glory. And it's yeah, all his yeah. and, and And not a one of us. Not one of us are are invincible. We all need to continue to stay in the fear of the Lord. Amen. You can't get comfortable. Because it can happen to anyone. If we get comfortable, if we get complacent, and we start taking too many days off, we slacken our prayer life, we slacken our relationship with Him, we slacken studying His Word, then we start falling asleep spiritually. Amen. And we're not going to hear Him when He calls. Right. So we need to be on our game. We need to be watching. We need to be awake and listening. Amen. Sounding the alarm, hearing the alarm. But that will be on your head. Exactly. <laughs> so we read uh, Exodus 10. I don't know. We'll go to Exodus 10, 13 through 14. Thank you for sharing, by the way. Yeah. Exodus 10, 13 through 14. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts came up over the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. They had never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. And the locusts didn't affect them. The locusts did not affect the Israelite people. And it's interesting because you look at the things that are happening now. I don't know if you guys have seen some of the news, worldwide news, Africa, different places like that. They're being swarmed by locusts right now. They're being swarmed by locusts right now, and the locusts are breeding at such a fast rate that they're worried that they're not going to be able to have enough time to replant and grow their crops because the locusts are spreading so fast, and they're breeding at an unnatural rate. These things, if we look around the world right now, we're seeing these things happen. Yeah. Hail, storms. Earthquakes, 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 heat waves. This is 120 degrees back away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's crazy. Yeah. We're seeing these things taking place. Yeah. And Messiah says in Matthew 24 that these are just birth pains to wake his people up. Yeah. Those who know what to look for. All right, next one. Um, Exodus 10, if you go down to verse 21 through 23, it says how the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness. This one really blows my mind. This one is like, wow. That there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even in darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky. There was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another. Nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But what? But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. That is incredible. That is the God that we serve. Yeah. Yeah. They had light in their dwellings. That's the kind of hope and faith 
that we need to have. To not be afraid of what the news media is telling us. To not be afraid of what everyone, even sometimes in our own families, is telling us. You need to be afraid. You need to do this. You need to do that. No, we do what the Word says. We honor Him. We obey Him. I'm not saying we, we test the Lord. I'm not saying we put ourselves in harm's way to test the Lord. Because the Messiah said it when Satan told him to jump off from the, the temple and, and, and the, the angels will catch him unless he dashes foot against the stone. And he said, no, for his dream, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So we don't put ourselves in harm's way on purpose. But if we're doing something like you said, like the Lord told you to go out and talk to the homeless, he told you to go out and be a minister to them. And we don't hold back or we don't stop that because of fear. And we believe in trust that he's going to protect us. And of course, we know we know if we go, uh, we'll go through these just briefly. Exodus 11, if you guys want to write that down, verses 4 through 7. All this full story, all the plagues, the hail was next. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, firstborn was next. The firstborn of all the land of the, of the Egyptians. All those who weren't marked by the blood of the Lamb. They were killed. They were taken. Except for those of Israel. Because they had what? They had the blood of the Lamb marked on them. Covered. They were covered by the blood of the Lamb. And when we keep Passover, this is why we keep it. This is a memorial for this time. Because God saved his people by the blood of the Lamb. And they called Jesus in the Word. Paul, John, they called him the Lamb of God, who was slain for our sins. These are why these feasts are to give you. Let's go, last few verses here. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Again, just showing that the Lord does not teach us that people are going to be poofing and vanishing and disappearing. But he, he gives us these feast days. He gives us these timelines, these warning signs, like Yom Shavuot, the day of the blast, to know what to look for. Yom Shavuot is in two weeks. And basically, we will be here blowing our shofars, having an assembly where all who are invited and want to come will be here blowing our shofars and our trumpets, and we'll be waiting on the Lord. And we'll be watching. And we'll be ready. Because these feast days, again, they're significant. Significant. They're prophetic. Many believe, and I, I am one of those, that it is on the Feast of Trumpets that the Lord will return. Because of what it represents. Right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying in two weeks the Lord's coming. Right, I'm right, right. That. But I'm saying on the okay. feast day of the Feast of Trumpets, the day of the blast, yeah. how many verses did I read that say that he's coming back at the sound of the trumpet? So it would make sense that he would come back on what? The day of trumpets. The day of the blast. God's feast days are prophetic. The Passover points to his first coming, his death, burial, and resurrection. The Passover, feast of unleavened bread, uh, the first fruits, resurrection. All these things, as we'll continue to get into them and learn, they all have prophetic significance that points to our side. So do the fall feasts. And the feast of trumpets, I believe, is when our Lord will return. Matthew 24, 29-31. Immediately after the tribulation, hello, uh -huh. after the tribulation yeah. of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, the Son of Man will appear in heaven. If anybody tries to tell you that there's a preacher about to show them this verse, Matthew 24, 29 to 31, because Yeshua said it himself after the tribulation. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The sound of the trumpet is the calling of God's people, just like we see in Torah. The calling of the holy convocation, the calling, the gathering of the Lord's people. People wonder, why, why are you so obsessed with the law and the Torah and the, the whole word of God? This is why, because it shows us these things. You will know the end from the beginning. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. He doesn't change. He gives us the answers 
to our questions, if we look at all of the word, Scripture is cyclical. History repeats itself. He gives us his plans laid out. Next one, Matthew 24, 36 through 44. We move down, still in chapter 24, we move down to verses 36 to 44. But of that day and hour, no one knows. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, that's very important, pay attention to that, as the days of Noah were, so also will be of the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. What took them all away? The flood. The flood took them all away. The wicked, right? Those who weren't listening to the warning, those who weren't heeding the warning, they were the ones that were taken away. Not God's people. God's people were protected. But the wicked and the ungodly, they were the ones. They were drinking and singing and marrying and acting like nothing was going on. And that's the kind of messages that we're hearing today. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Tomorrow's as good as today or even better. Next year will be good. Next year will be even better. 2020s, you know, all these good, positive things, but no warnings. <laughs> then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Here, here, here it is. Yeah. This is it. This is the rapture. This is what people will disappear. This is what people will poof, be gone, and airplanes will crash, and cars will crash. This is it. Wait a minute. What, what did we just read? Who's taken away? The wicked. The wicked. Jesus is referencing the time of Noah and the flood. He uses that. He says, as in the days of Noah. Yeah. So shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And they were not ready. So they were taken away by the water. And he says, For as in the days before the flood, read that again, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken. The other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, so you're not swarmed and taken away by the wrath of God. He's referencing this in Noah. It's exactly what he's saying. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allow his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So all of this, all the patterns that we're seeing in the Bible, and how God protects his people, and like he did in the flood, the wicked are the ones that get carried away. They're the ones that manage to get destroyed and get plundered, as they did in the days of Noah by the water, because they weren't watching, they weren't paying attention. And the Lord came upon them like a thief in the night because they weren't listening to the warnings. So he says, watch therefore, be ready so that you ain't surprised. So that you can know the sign and what to look for. And, I, I mean, and here's, here's a big argument that I think supports that the Lord will come back on young Teruah, on the Feast of Trumpet, because he says specifically, no one will know the day or the hour, right? Well, the Feast of Yom Teruah is on the first day, right, of the seventh month, as we read in Leviticus. It's on the first day of the seventh month. And you know what determines the beginning of a month in the Hebrew calendar? It's the sighting of the new moon. It's the sighting of the new moon. The only feast the Israelites had to watch for was this one, because it was determined by the new moon festival. This was a, this was a practice in Israel they would wait on the new moon. And they would wait two to three days even before that first sliver crescent shows in the sky. And once that happened, Josephus writes about it, historians write about it. Once that happened, they saw the sliver in the sky. They would declare the new moon. They would send signal fires all throughout the land of Israel. And it would be announced to the whole nation, the new moon is here, the month has started, and they would have a feast day. Just like we read, blow the trumpets at the beginning of your, of your 
feast days and your new moons, they would keep it as a, as a feast day, a minor feast day, if you will. And so this is why I personally believe that this is why Messiah says, nobody knows the day or the hour because you have to keep watch for it. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to look for it in the sky. You have to be paying attention, looking above, just like they did when they were waiting for the new moon. I think it's 1 Samuel, 1 or 2 Samuel 15, when it talks about how Saul and Jonathan and David were waiting two or three days for the new moon to come. I thought it's talking about the time of the new moon. They would feast. They, they didn't know exactly when it was coming, so they would feast two, two days, one to two days, waiting for the new moon. Matthew 24, last couple of verses here. Matthew 24, 13 to 14. Matthew 24, 13 to 14. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The one who endures to the end endures what? We don't have to endure anything if we're getting banished, spoofed out of here before all the bad things happen. We have to endure to the end. When the persecution starts, which has already started, when the chaos and the mayhem starts, the, the, the looting and rioting and the ungodliness, the violence, started. we have to endure to the end. To go through that. We have to go through that. And the book of Revelation tells us that for those who aren't on their job, for the, for the believers who claim Messiah but they're lukewarm, God's going to make them go through that too to refine them. To refine them, their hearts and their characters. And it's out of love that he does that. Because he chastens those he loves. Like Proverbs tells us. So the last few remarks that we have here, the last, the, the, the joyful shouts, of the shofar, the trumpets. So we, we talked about how the trumpet is a, a signal of warfare, a signal of warning, um, a signal of an alarm of, of on the battlefield. And lastly, there's a few places and verses that I just have a few where it shows us that this is a, a, a symbol of praise and worship and a joyful noise. And I think that's pretty fitting for when our king comes, we'll hear that loud trumpet, that loud shofar, and then we'll all hallelujah and praise God together. We'll be blowing trumpets and blowing trumpets and sounding a joyful noise right there with him. Go ahead. Um, there was a question earlier. Just you made me think of it. Someone asked, will we hear the first six trumpets? I think that's, that's the that you're reading. I, I think that that's quite possible. Maybe. Why not? Maybe some people will and some people won't. There's been videos online of different trumpet sounds sounding throughout different places in the world, Africa, Israel, places like that. Some of them sound pretty convincing, but at the end, at the end of the day, we have to use discernment of what we see online, the videos that people make, you know what I mean? Um, but hey, I think it's quite possible the closer we are, I mean, there's going to be seven trumpets that last, that sound. I don't know who all is going to hear them, but maybe some, some people will. You know? So, that's a great question. That'd be cool. <laughs> Probably be yeah. scary, but at least you'll know, hey, there's our warnings. Right. Start warning more people. You know? First Chronicles 13, 8 says, Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps and stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, with trumpets. Again, a picture of when our Lord and Savior comes back, we'll be doing these things with Him. We'll be, we'll be praising, we'll be worshiping, we'll be dancing, we'll be blowing shofars, we'll be blowing trumpets. This is our hope to look forward to. This time, this life is only temporary. We'll go, we'll go to uh, Psalm 150. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpets. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. We will all praise our King. With our shouts, with our voices, with our instruments, with our trumpets. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely want a trumpet. God willing, we make it. I make it. I do it. I want my own trumpet, man. <laughs> And I want to blow the trumpets and the shofars. 
if y'all would let me, unto him, coronating him as he walks through the gates, coronating him and, and declaring his righteous kingship over all the earth. Amen? Amen. All of this is what I believe Yom Shrua points to. This feast that is coming on us in two weeks. It paints a picture, a blast to prepare for battle. A declaration that Yehovah goes before us. A warning to repent for our sins. A joyful shout and praise to worship and gladness the goodness of our king. And a coordinating of the rightful king who will come. This is Yom Shavuot. This is the feast day of the Lord. It is his feast day. So, again, as, as we near to it in the next two weeks, prepare your hearts. Prepare your hearts for the day of the blast. When this day comes upon us, again, everyone's welcome to come blow the shofars, you can have some snacks, some, some picnics and whatnot, and keep the feast day together. This is a holy feast day that God calls his and will blow these shofars. We will sound the alarm so that this neighborhood will know the sound of the shofar. And most of all, let us prepare for the final, the great Yom Shrua, the great day of the blast. Whether it's on the feast day of Yom Shrua or not, we still know that there will be a trumpet sound when he comes. So let us prepare for that blast. Amen? Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shalom shalom.